Coming up on WHYY Delaware tonight, using chemistry to answer questions about Native American art. We'll show you what preservationists can learn about objects several hundred years old. Details coming up from the WHYY Health and Science Desk next. Museum objects usually have information about where the item was found and how it was used, but not necessarily its chemical composition. WHYY's Carrie Grenz reports from the Science Desk on how science is picking art apart. Carrie? Stephanie, there's a lot of science behind cultural preservation. One graduate student at the University of Delaware is using chemistry to go back in time almost 300 years to figure out what dyes Native Americans used in a particular type of embroidery. These little baggies have samples of naturally dyed quills, porcupine quills. Native Americans have used them for centuries as decoration. Quill work is a uniquely North American embroidery technique. It was used by Native Americans before beadwork was introduced. Native Americans would use dyed quills on moccasins, on pouches, on bags, on cradle boards, would be wrapped around pipes. Doctoral student Christina Cole says people generally know who made particular pieces of quill work, but not how they were made. Once modern dyes were introduced, like wit dyes, um, their precursors from the 1856 forward, we sort of lost track of what the original materials were. So there's a little bit of this knowledge gap. Cole is very carefully swabbing quills to get a sample of their dyes. Then she puts them through a chemical screen to find out what they're made of. So far I have found uh, materials that are suggestive of, um, of blood root of gold thread, some of the materials that are more commonly cited in the literature but have never been sort of definitively established as being on a particular piece. The process she uses is called chromatography. Chromatography is the science of separating compounds into their individual components. Stephen Miles is the general manager at Analtech, which makes chromatography equipment. He gives us a demonstration of how it works. You can actually take samples of a product that is very, very old, that has dye in it, extract the dye, and do a test on any dyes that you have in a database to find out what dye they might be, what time period it's from. The different colors correspond to the different components in a mixture of dye. Christina Cole says the answers to her investigation could shed light on early American trading. Knowing, for instance, that a particular dye stuff came from uh, Nova Scotia, if you have a piece of quill work from Nova Scotia as opposed to a dye that came, say, from British Columbia, could tell you a lot more about the trade routes that might have been in place at the time. Cole expects that some of her results may also contradict assumptions that people have had about how Native American quill work was made. It's, it's a little like being sort of the crime scene investigator, but with a less squeamish problem. <laughs> Now, chromatography is actually used in solving crimes, in reality and on TV. There is one CSI episode that used the technique to determine that a document had been forged. These techniques are sometimes glamorized on television and not always accurately. Here to explain some of the myths and realities of forensics is Clytrice Watson. She is a professor at Delaware State University and head of the forensic biology program there. Dr. Watson, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, can you tell us, what are some of the most common applications of forensic biology? Well, first let me explain that forensic science is the merging of the legal system or the law along with science. Forensic biology is a branch of forensic science that focuses on the um, biological aspects of science, dealing with biological fluids such as blood, semen, saliva, and basically um, the DNA. And DNA is often used to link an individual to a particular crime or a particular activity, or it's also used to exclude an individual from a crime or a particular activity. What are some of the frontiers of how forensic biology can be used? Um, if you've been on top of the current news stories, um, a lot of DNA evidence has come to surface to clear a number of individuals um, of crimes that they actually did not commit and they've served quite a bit of time in the penitentiary um, for these crimes. DNA um, science is also used in um, identification of individuals as well as um, the incidents. I'll, I'll use an example, the, the last czar of Russia the unknown um, children were finally identified based upon DNA evidence. And forensic science is also used in the area of food science. 
Um, if you remember the current outbreak of salmonella with tomatoes, and the USDA actually had to go through and identify the source of the salmonella contamination, and that's a form of forensic science, but related to the food industry. Yeah, it's fascinating. Last question, just very quickly then, what are some of the myths about forensic biology? What can't it do that, that people are sort of led to believe that it can do? Very quickly. A lot of our students come to our program and they think that they're going to be CSI and they're going to conduct these studies like it's done on TV. That is glamorized and you cannot solve a crime in an hour. You don't get DNA evidence or um, chemical evidence in an hour. So students as well as the public need to understand that what you see on TV is basically Hollywood effects. The real um, activities that take place in the lab take time take a lot of work and effort and is not as easy as what you may see on television. Great. Well, I'm, and I'm sure your students are learning that there. That was Dr. Clytrice Watson from Delaware State University.